Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me in the studio artist Jill Hoy. Thank you for coming in today. My pleasure, Lisa. Jill, you and I have actually known each other quite some time now. Maybe, maybe about 10-ish years, perhaps. Yeah. Sort of different iterations of each of our lives, I think. So I'm wondering, as we're kind of in this new phase of your life, what are some of the things that have been, you've been thinking about with regard to your art? My, this new phase of my, well, my late husband died in 2014. And so, and then with COVID, I've really been able to totally concentrate on being a painter without immediate responsibilities of being a parent and a spouse. And um, that's been a deep pleasure at this point in my life um, to just work, which is one of my favorite things to do. And um, delve deeply into all the knowledge I've accumulated over a lifetime of painting. Um, and just see where, which I've integrated at this point into my painting. And so it's all there, but coming out in a very fluid, integrated manner. And um, without a lot of intellectualizing of knowledge I have as bedrock. Um, yeah, so it's, and see where it takes me. Part of that integration, I started doing watercolors. Somebody called, uh, a friend called up and said, oh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm curating a show in New York of watercolors. Do you and John do watercolors? And we were on separate phones and we both went, we don't do watercolor, you know, like really dismissively. And I hung up the phone and I thought, wow, that is a really old knee jerk reaction to the frustration of working with watercolor. And at this point in my life, so I started in doing it and found that I had the con both the control and the willingness to let go to whatever that water d does, which it does all sorts of wild things. Um, and perhaps that had the most influence on my oil painting of anything in recent time. It became more gestural, more distilled, more about being in the moment and responding, and um, became pretty key in integrating a lot of earlier artists who were on Deer Isle, who were seminal influences in my life. Um, Carl Schrag, Leon Golden, Sally Amster, David Lund, um, Stephen Pace, Joe Osicki. I mean, there were a lot of really good painters up there on Deer Isle, and um, I grew up in their studios, watching their work evolve, listening to conversations that I partially understood and later became, came to understand as my own work evolved. Um, yeah. Light, people talking about light, very abstract. What are they talking about? But going back and forth between California, New York, Connecticut, and um, Maine. Yeah, my dad bought a place on Deer Island in 1965, and um, it's been a key part of my evolution. I always say Maine has trained me to, to its tempo, which is pretty fast, actually. So when you were growing up and you were spending time in the artist studios, did you have a sense that this was someday what you wanted to do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my mom knew at eighth grade. I, they cut art from the schools in eighth grade, and it was like, we moved a great deal, and um, I think drawing was a bedrock um, stabilization for me, a place to go that was mine. And um, she saw that, so she started looking for private art lessons, and we had very little money at that point, and, but she... Um, 
a woman, she had just opened an antique shop. And a woman came in and went, wow, this is amazing. Very visual. I lived in a very visual household. And um, turns out that was Joanne Falbo. She had gone to Yale grad school, Virginia Commonwealth before that, and she just started mainlining it into me. Um, became a major mentor in my life. Never spared me criticism. You know, I can pretty much take whatever is handed to me. And, um, yeah. So... From then on, it really gelled. She was a great painter. And uh, to be given a great painter at that age as a template and a woman um, was, was great. And she became a lifetime friend. It seems to me in talking to people who are artists that there is an ongoing back and forth and, an, and a sharing of experiences and a learning from one another about about the craft, about, about the art. Is that true for everybody, or is that just a group of people that I've been talking to? I think you choose... You know, it's interesting when you go to a museum, for example, and I look at art all the time, um, and what you respond to changes. What you may have zoned in on last year won't be what it is this year. And so... Different art will speak to you, and artists are notorious for plundering, for plucking. You know, you just want to absorb what stimulates you, take note of it, and the whole act of synthesizing information is such a mysterious and wonderful one um, in whatever realm you're in. But visually, um, you know, I spent a year traveling in Europe looking at the great art of Europe when I was in my early 20s and drawing a lot and knowing that all that information was somehow going to come back out, and it did. So whether it's artists, I find looking at art that interests me, not any art, I'm very... I'm, I'm a hard critic also, and, um, and pretty discerning about what I want to take in. So I can speed through a lot of art until I find what I want to talk to, person or piece, um, that I find relevant to my process. So give me an example of some of art recently that you want to spend time with. No, oh, I love Grace de Janeiro's work. And, um, Oh, I saw a show of Gideon Box down in Boston that was pretty exciting, and Robin Reynolds, whose um, glorious flower paintings I just adore. They're just wild and deep. And um, I like uh, Greta Van Campen's work, who she works on the same bay, the Penobscot Bay, as I do. Um, oh, there's a great show of um, Matisse down in Philadelphia that I'm dying to see. And um, there's a show of Leonard Baskin at the Farnsworth. And um, oh, I, I just bought a Lisa Becu uh, sculpture that I just adore, granite. Um, yeah, that I've been thinking about her work for a long time. I finally sprung for it. Um, yeah. And of course, I live with John Imber's work, which is awesome, you know, and always gives me power and his presence. And I'm great painter. Yeah, well, I'm sure I'll come up with many others. Um, I've, I collect a lot of art, and I'm surrounded by mm, a lot of shrags and goldens. And yeah, anyway, it's my life. You and John were together for how long? Um, I think our marriage spanned, um, I should know this, 25 years, something like that. Yeah. Or knowing each other, maybe longer. And, and how did that impact your art, to actually be with another artist? John was very secure in his ego, 
And having a powerful wife didn't bother him. You know, he, he gravitated to it. He always went out with Scorpios. And um, uh, artistically, it was fertile ground. Um, and he didn't mind. He really paid attention to criticism and was pretty daring about taking it. Um, I'm probably less so. I didn't always agree with what his, he was uh, Suggesting, I think he, um, yeah, interesting. But um, we made a good team, a really good team. He was, he was uh, good at things I'm not good at and uh, vice versa. I brought him to Maine. Well, he had come to Maine. That's where I met him up there. But um, I sort of gave him the island. And uh, that's wrong, too. He, he had come to Deer Isle for many years. I just opened a lot of doors for him. So when you say that you've really enjoyed this phase of your life that's that's really solely focused on on your own art and your own process, mm -hmm. can you can you think of ways that it's different from when you and John were both kind of coexisting as artists and creating as artists? Well, I don't have that sophisticated eye responding to my work in a daily, you know, almost like breathing, um, which we really, there was a lot of exchange going on, and we were always looking at each other's work and playing off it um, and giving feedback on what we were seeing. So that's a treasure of an experience for sure, and there's very few people whose eye I trust I don't have that now. I live in an, a wonderful artist co-op in um, Somerville, which I spend about five months in a year. And um, and John's class still comes up to Stonington. And um, he always taught a class the third week in July, and they still come and kind of channel John, but in the, our perfectly fine in themselves now without, you know, that. But he, they definitely took in a lot of his teachings. And I've joined it as a um, participant to look at work and to have them look at my work. And that's probably the most formal um, feedback I get these days. On my art. Um, I've run a gallery up in Maine for many years, 38 maybe, um, in Stonington. And so I do get a lot of direct feedback. Uh, oh, I mean, I get a lot of more feedback than most artists get. But mm, yeah, and I'm, it's always interesting to get that. But that's different than, it's, it's information it's different than really knowledgeable um, crit sessions, yeah. So if you don't have that ongoing direct feedback from someone that you trust as much as John, how has that impacted the last eight years? You know, I don't really need it. I've, um, I've spent a lifetime <laughs> doing it, looking at it, talking about it with people. You know, I have, I have good friends who are painters. Um, at different intervals of my life, they've been in closer proximity. We all moved from California. I went to UC Santa Cruz and moved to Manhattan and lived there for many years and knew a bunch of really good artists. And um, so they're all still in my life. And um, periodically we intersect. I think I really trust myself as an artist, and I, um, I, I like my evolution. I'm a slow spinner, um, and it's happening. It's evolving, and it's certainly evolving from the beginning of um, my career as a painter, and um, it's getting looser and more open and more gestural and lyrical and 
kind of letting things float, letting drawing integrate with painting on top and below. And so it has a pulse that I find very stimulating, has a lot of kinetic energy um, and vitality. So I'm pretty excited about what I'm doing now. And I kind of spin back and forth between more detailed and more grounded work and then letting it go, letting it just woof, be its thing. Yeah, trying. You have to draw your audience along with you and um, they're not necessarily where my head's at. So I, I try to kind of bounce it back and forth. Come on. <laughs> Um, check this out, yeah. So I know if, that for people who are watching um, or listening to our conversation, there may be a question among the non-artists as to why watercolors are something that you and John originally weren't doing. And I don't know enough about art myself to understand this. So. I always did gouache, which is opaque watercolor. It has chalk in it. So you can, it's much more like oil paint. You can change your mind, lay stroke on top of stroke. It'll hold that color. You're building it. Watercolor is a wild card. And either you have to be super controlled, which doesn't interest me at all. And, um, But I, I draw a lot, and I'm a really, I can draw very, I can really draw. And um, so, the, so it's interesting, I could either draw, my approach could be drawing first or just launching into it. And you get very different results depending if you've given yourself a structure to follow or just are trusting yourself to just go with it. And um, for years I did these, uh, I ran a figure drawing a mo nude model class. And it was always very interesting to see the difference between the paintings in that in those terms. Um, so it just wasn't comfortable, I think, for either one of us to be that out of control, basically. But at this point, as I said, there's both control and openness to the wild card and um you know i never really asked john because he was certainly open to the wild card uh i th i think uh he, he really doubted because we did do watercolor together and he'd douse it with water and everything would go together and it became just like morasses of color um if he'd done it more, he would have known what he wanted. He was great at pastel, um, one of the great pastellers of all time, I'd say. Um, watercolor just wasn't his thing. But now, from what you're saying, you, you're, you're seeing it as actually informing non-watercolor works that you're doing. Yeah. My son um, just sent me a Spalder and a, uh, oh, Gabe. Um, he's, an artis he's doing artisanal plastering for the top 1% of the country. And um, he, uh, he's learned many techniques. He didn't want to be a painter. Um, so anyway, he was like, Gabe's a good critic. I listened to my son, yeah. That I'd say he was really brought up listening to us and is fearless about his critiques, ruthless. And uh, I listen to him and trust what he sees. But uh, he just sent me two brushes, and I am so intimidated <laughs> about using them. But he's going to give me lessons. And, um, you know, de Kooning was a sign painter first. And uh, so a lot of those fabulous strokes that he does were with sign painting brushes. And um, my son uh, just sent me this big, I think that's the Spalder. It's a big brush. And John used big wide brushes and he'd um, just flow it on. So this is all back to watercolor, which if you have a beautiful watercolor brush, it'll hold your, you can get a big stroke and then taper it out to the finest tendril. And um, it's very exciting. Yeah, those are usually sable brushes. I'm really enjoying this conversation because I think as someone who 
doesn't, is not engaged in creating visual art at this point. Understanding the, some of the process, you know, some of the considerations, some of the materials, what you can do with them. And that's not something that I have any background in. So as you're describing it to me, it makes, it just puts a lot of things in perspective. Yeah. Well, I, as perhaps you know, I'm a plein air oil painter, plein air oil painter. And um, I don't have the most concise setup. And I'm in the wind a lot. And I'm moving back and forth between colors and mixing them. So one hand is full of paintbrushes and the other hand, you know, is flying around doing. So it'll be interesting to integrate those two um, brushes into it. John would mix bowls of color. And I have not done that. I use a glass palette and um, on a stool and my canvas and... Um, make several trips getting my gear out to the spot, you know. Would you mind looking at these with me and telling well, me a little bit more about them? Sometimes when I come back from, um, from Stonington and I'm not really sure what I'm doing, um, I'll work from oil paintings because there is so much structure and possibility in them that I can um I can explore and I I like working on the full sheets but I'm going to Portugal in a few days and um I just thought I better warm up on uh, on some watercolors and um and I came to the evergreen show and we had these exquisite corsages and at the end there was a whole pile of them left and so I took Two more in addition to mine. They were ranuncula, anemones, and um, roses. And I, when I got home, I have these spun glass, small spun glass um, vases, and I put them in, and they are still going strong. So I just started doing these, um, this series of, I'm not sure if you can see them, um, Watercolors playing around with those just uh, beautiful forms in the morning light. Um, and then just work on them all day long. They'll be sitting on the dining room table and um, I'll just go, ah, oh, yeah, it just needs a little more twist and curve there. So it's just been a pleasure to play around and sort of enter the realm of both studio painting and rethinking I often will switch to figurative narrative painting, which is based on things I saw in Maine or in the city that have just anchored themselves in my mind, and I've done drawings of them. So I have a, a lot of those ideas fl flying around in there, but I haven't yet put out the oil paint. Um, so it's like juicing the, getting, you know the bones, uh, the fibroids going, not fibroids, but, you know, water into the muscle structure. And when you're in Portugal, is this a, an art-based trip or? Most trips are art-based, um, but also family. It'll be both. Yeah. And how much art are you able to incorporate into your trip? Oh, a lot. I'll bring, you know, I'll bring watercolor, gouache, um, and... I'll, I'll be doing it, yeah. And then I'll have a lot of good models and uh, people there to work from. And it's supposed, it's been raining, so we'll probably do a lot of um, portraiture. When you and I met first, it was before John was ill. And then I knew you while John was ill. And we worked on a story together, you and I, about your experience with John's illness. And then, of course, I've known you since that time. And I think most of us are changed by significant life events. And I, I would say that John's was more significant a life event than many people experience, just given that he had to, both of you, your whole family had to kind of see things progress so that he went from being this very strong and wonderful kind of physical person to someone who created art in a very different way. Mm -hmm. 
valiantly courageous. He was always such a courageous painter. Um, and how he faced this whole situation of having ALS and diminishing ability, which increasingly dramatic, down to the point of painting with headgear that crisscrossed his head and a um, brush coming out and just nodding, and it was all the neck, and that didn't last long. That, um, and then he died. Um, two days after he could no longer paint, which is pretty much what I suspect, you know? You wonder, after he can't paint, that's so much who he was. Um, your question, and so certainly mortality became, um, you better go for it while you can. You're strong. I'm strong. I'm in good health. And just hitting it hard, like really wanting to be the painter I am in the power I have. Yeah, I'd say that was the takeaway. And we had, you know, going in another direction, we had an amazing community of people helping us on both, in both communities, amazing backup um, and love coming to both all of us, which really helped enormously. I mean, I can't tell you how many. Yeah. It's a powerful, um, it was under the circumstances, it was the best of, we had so much support. from our building, people that worked at MIT, people that were in, you know, trying to figure out the technology of it, people who came back. You just need, I don't know how people do ALS by themselves, and it can certainly destroy families. And um, it's a complicated um, illness, period, how we cope with it. And you were both young when this took place. John was 64, I was 60, yeah. Gabe was 19. So also the fact that he had this diagnosis and he really had his life kind of compressed down in an unexpected way. Yeah, and he switched to his left hand and became a left-handed painter. So if you get the opportunity to see Imber's left hand, please see it. Um, it's a main master's movie. It is a great art movie documenting both of our lives, but, you know, heavy on John. And how he, uh, wow, he just poured a lot of knowledge into that film by Dick Kane. Um, so, and um, Compassionate Care ALS is an awesome organization that backed us up every step of the way. Ron Hoffman, I can't say enough good things about CCALS, yeah, which is a grassroots um, support foundation as opposed to a research foundation helping you navigate the demise of your body um, dysfunctions, not your mind, but your body, um, but psychologically also, for sure, because that's a whole major component of that. So... It's an interesting contrast then where his life became compressed at the end and he did sound, I mean, he, he was very courageous in his approach and he, he, he went down eventually, still painting till almost the very end. Mm -hmm. But he really, he was a very powerful, very strong individual all the way to the end. Yeah. And certainly the public persona was one of real optimism and, um, yeah, valiancy. Um, and the work that came out of that is very exciting body of work. And he f felt some of the strongest in his life. And he had really, um, again, how integrating Switching from your right to left hand is a big 
deal. I have Martha Diamond is a painter in New York, and she always said she'd switch to her left hand when she had any important, really key gestures to make, that it had a whole different power to it. And so to actually, and Nell Blaine also got um, polio fairly young in her life, and she, um, she'd been an abstract painter initially, and then switched to her left hand, and her work changed entirely. Um, so it's very interesting to see what happened. And John was very excited by the left hand. Um, you know, he really liked crudeness, authenticity, and so when it, you had to, it threw in the crudeness for sure. And this is all documented in the movie, so it's interesting to see. And then in contrast, you and I were talking about sort of this being the next third of your life. Mm -hmm. You actually, you have this, ex presumably, an expansive time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. An expansive time ahead of you. And you're in the midst of fully experiencing that. So what does that feel like to you? Well, I met somebody, and I'm really enjoying that tremendously. So that's adding a, like a whole other uh, dimension. He's a musician, so he understands process of experimentation and innovation. And um, yeah, and has great concentration and does watercolor with me also. Um, so he'll come out and play music on site, which is outrageously great on these amazing places. And then um, he'll sit down and just paint also. And he, it's it, to share with someone unbroken concentration is a very special thing, and not to have to talk. Sometimes you get that as a portrait. Uh, I do a lot of portraits and um, to have permission to sit with people in silence or have a rhythmic flow of what goes through is, um, well, it's, it's got powerful. Um, to enter that river together is a great thing um, because you're really descending into the underworld almost when you paint and just merging as a plein air painter I feel like I just enter as part of the environment, letting the play of tides and wind and things flying by and clouds moving. And um, there's a lot of information just kind of hitting you and you're cherry picking. Um, and of course, his work is totally different than mine. So it sounds like you're enjoying this experience. I am. Yeah. It's a I'm very much enjoying it. Yeah. So it's hard to say where that'll go in the work, but um it's certainly an enlivening experience. Yeah. Well, I know you and I have known each other during I think very stressful times for you in your own life and I don't know if I've ever fully thanked you for the opportunity to spend time with you and John um, as you were going through all of this. I think you really, you opened up your life in a way that not everyone is willing to do. You know, I wanted it to be as vital an experience for John to make it worth his while sticking around and, um, and to have love pouring into him, attention, validation, you know, all those things. And uh, I did not, and, and I needed to replenish myself also. And so part of allowing permeability of whoever was comfortable being part of that process um, also allowed me to have time to recoup um, and be there in the way I needed to be there the rest of the time. And to know what my limitations are. Other people are better at minutia than I am of comfort, which um, that was not my forte. Yeah. Well, 
I, I can't speak for anybody else but myself, but I do appreciate your willingness to be part of that in the minor way that I was. Uh, I think that any um, shedding light on that process is a powerful one. And I um, appreciated your intuition, your knowledge and intuition. Yeah. Well, I hope that I get to uh, continue to benefit from the wonderful life that you're living as a bystander and a friend um, in this next third. Thank you. And I really appreciate your taking the time to come in and talk with me today about all well, Thank you very much this. for having me. Yeah. I've been speaking with artist Jill Hoy, and I encourage you to learn more about her through the Portland Art Gallery in Portland or online. Um, I think that every time I see Jill's work, I, I just feel the vibrancy of life, and I suspect that that is not an uncommon response for people. So I, I've i really enjoyed having the vibrancy of your your personal self today in the studio with me today. Thank you. And I've loved working with the Portland Art Gallery, which is a beautiful space and vital, full of art. Yeah, beautifully done. So thank you. Very-